Good afternoon and thank you for joining the Office of Public Instruction as we um, share out some of the information with regards to the plans, both the safe return and the art plans this afternoon. My name is Wendy Fons and I'm the director of Esther and Ean's programming effort at the Office of Public Instruction in Montana. And also attending with me this afternoon is Rebecca Brown, who is the program manager. So as we begin this um, dive into the plans. There are two of them. So I want to just kind of anchor on the fact that there are in fact two separate plans. And as we go through the description today, we will be covering what those two plans are and how you access them. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. We do have a chat session. You can enter in information there. Um, and then you can also call us at any time or send us an email with regards to specific questions. Next slide, please. So our contact information is available here. We do encourage you to use phone if that seems appropriate. Emails are wonderful. Um, they're, they're better than the snail mail as it is now, but it can get challenging sometimes to describe the situation that you and your district may particularly have. One thing that does really help both Rebecca and I and the rest of the team who are here to support you at OPI is if in your email you contain a phone number for contact back your LE number, which is the four digit number usually used in e-grants, and also your district name. So I know that some of you have different kinds of protocol for uh, email send outs, but if you're able to contain that within either the subject line or somewhere in the body of your email itself, that will help us um, be able to problem solve or to help you better in solving any challenges that you have on the plans or other uh, areas of e-grant. Next slide, please. So when we start in looking at the goal for this session, um, there are three particular goals. One is to talk about the safe return plans, why those are necessary, the ARP plans, again, use of funds, why those are necessary, and the fact that they are taking the place of the CSIP plans. We're gonna give you some tips for compliance on both of those plans. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about some proposed changes to this plan process and allow you the opportunity to give us feedback both today but also in the future, if you would like to be a part of the review committee, we are forming a review committee, which will help with the data collection and the plans themselves. So one of the things to take away from this slide is are those pictures on the right hand side, the images that show the amount of money that was allocated to the United States under the SR funds for education and then also the state of Montana. So it's a significant amount. This grant was a very large one. And I think that's important to keep in mind as we go forward with these um, grant compliances that the ask by the Department of Ed for these plans to be maintained as part of the compliance um, is in part because these grants are very large and because they are federal grants. Next slide, please. So when we're gonna start with the safe return plans and these plans, think of them sort of like earthquake plans or intruder lockdown plans. Um, there's something that you may have a uh, on-site person maintain at your district. And what you want to make sure that you're doing is to update those every six months at least to make sure that in the event of an earthquake or an intruder lockdown that the plan doesn't say to the substitute teacher or someone else to go to the green door when the green door has been painted black somewhere along the line. So think of it as sort of instructions that you're giving to staff um, and the community to say, this is where you'd meet your children in the event of this. These are the things, the measures that we're taking to bring our students back into a safe setting. So they're those instructional components of your operation in a safe environment. Districts are the ones who maintain these plans. So they're maintained in a PDF format. They do need to be up to, uploaded to your district website. So that way the public can view them. And then we actually receive a link to those. And as long as when you first created these, as long as that link is the same, the file name is the same, so you haven't updated the file name or the location hasn't changed on your side, then when you go to update your own PDF, our site will automatically update. So I know sometimes IT staff at the end of the year make changes to servers or they make changes to file naming. Those kinds of disruptions will end up breaking the link on our side and then we'll get a 404 error. So please try and maintain those links or let us know that that link has changed. Um, these plans do require to be updated twice a year. We have to look at them. So part of our compliance with this grant 
is that we are required by the Department of Education to look at these plans in June and December to make sure that you have actually updated and reviewed them. So what we recommend is that you do that review and update in May and November. That way, when we look in June and December, we'll be looking at an updated version. So make sure on that first cover page that you've actually got a date saying last updated. Um, that really helps the review process for us to look at that quickly and make sure that you're in compliance. The second part of this safe return plans um, is the fact that it does require community engagement. So everything with ESSER is really um, partly to be out in the public and transparent so that the public knows what's going on with these funds and how districts are using them and to what extent the compliance is being met. So it is important that you uh, engage the community in the discussion. You can post it on your website. You can bring it to the school board meeting. But we really do encourage you to uh, engage in different methods, not just one, with your community. And I know districts that are small or large are going to have different modes of doing that but it's really looking at meaningful stakeholder consultation on the plans. Again, you're creating a PDF, and so that management of it is really within your realm. So you can create it in a Google Doc and then change it over to a PDF or in a Word Doc and convert it over. Next slide. So now we're gonna switch hats and go into the maintenance of the ARP ESSER plans. And these are the plans that some of you have been asking about that move into the um, sort of replacement of the CSIP this year. So the ARP ESSER plans are very similar to the safe return in the sense that they need to be maintained. They need to be updated twice a year. Again, we're recommending that you do that in May and November, and that will be so that we can look at compliance in June and December and report out that they are actually updated. However, the mode of maintenance of these is significantly different than the safe return. The safe return plans, again, are a PDF that you're maintaining on your site. The ARP ESSER plans are through a portal through our site, and you need unique access and uh, access codes in order to get into them. So each district has a different plan, and each district has a different portal access. And maintaining that is our responsibility, and your responsibility is to go in and update those. So if you have a change in super or you have a change in the clerk, or you have a change in the person who's actually the authorized representative doing the ARP ESSER plans or maybe e-grant. If you've notified our staff in e-grants that that change has occurred, but you have not notified us that it needs to be changed on the ARP ESSER plans, then they don't get connected. So please let us know if there's a change in staff so that we can get you a new portal access. I will tell you at the moment that there's a delay in getting those access codes to you. So we understand that and we're gonna work to move that forward. So if the, the due date for the CSIP plans is November 1st, and those of you who have notified me that you know, you're a new clerk you, or a new superintendent, new authorized representative, you need access because we can't give you that access right now. I'm making a note of that and you won't be out of compliance for that November 1st um, deadline. So just going forward, um, just kind of look at creating those plans in this portal process. Now, we tend to send out email, email instructions, the month before the plans are due. So in May, we sent out a notification saying, um, here are the instructions for the safe return. Here are the instructions for the um, ARP plans. And we gave you a portal access link and your code to get in. Um, again, if you either have lost that email or you're a new superintendent and you don't have access to that email, just reach out to us and we'll get that for you. Um, the secure portal is maintained on our website as well. So we've got a list of all those districts and the uh, plans that are updated. So you can also look there to see, oh, ha has that been updated? Am I in the right place right now to be in compliant with that? Next slide, please. The ARP ESSER plans are currently taking the place of the CSIP. And so that plan um, is really based also on Title I funding and how these fundings relate to your school district. So it was decided that you don't need to do two of them. Just doing one this year is um, fine. So they chose the ARP ESSER plan. You can use that as a replacement. I do not know, I've been asked by several districts, is this gonna be the case going forward? Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. 
So what we can say right now is that doing the ARP ESSER plan will in fact bring you into compliance with the CSIP plan. So just um, note that the ARP plan is now sort of double dipping into compliance on two sides um, that's required in there. Next slide, please. So when we talk about stakeholder um, or community engagement, meaningful consultation, those are things that are important for both of these plans. So there is a template. We have a template on our website that you can go look at to say, okay, this is what this plan looks like. If you've never seen one before, then you can actually go look at your own plan and see how they match the template to the um, actual one that you've created. The frequently asked question guide coming in from the Department of Ed on page 14 and 17, identify the need for community engagement. And part of this is because of that large amount of money that was given to districts in this grant. And so the compliance on that is that that be shared out with the constituents who, of course, our taxes are being used to, to cover these, um, these grants. That's where the funding's coming from. So you can look at the frequently asked questions and see how that relates and what kinds of suggestions they have. There's several that are listed. I realize the frequently asked question guide is over a year old. Um, the Department of Ed has said that they're going to provide a new one, but unfortunately they haven't yet. The minute it's available, I'll be sure to post it out there on our website. Some of the areas that they suggest using meaningful consultation are listed on the left and the right. So touching bases with your parents and your students and your teachers and staff, uh, looking at local bargaining units, the county health department, that would be useful with regards particularly to the safe return, having them review it and, and indicate if those are good measures that you're taking. You can post it on a web on a webinar, you can do a webinar, you can do public meetings, media could be Facebook, it could be in the newspaper, could be from email. So lots of different methods are available to you as a district. Uh, most districts have you know, methods that they use to push information out, like when there's a snow day or when there's um, school changes in terms of holiday schedules. So it's really looking at what is your community, what does your school district do to engage the community in this discussion. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we're often asked about is how do you deal with the community engagement when maybe some of the questions that might be asked could be challenging, especially with the plan use? And I think it's important to recognize the fact that while these funds are being spent in a particular way, they're, all of the information about why it's being spent that way isn't necessarily known or isn't transparent. And so identifying in the community, this is why we are spending the money this way or engaging the community in that discussion to help them understand the why, as well as give input into how the money is being spent, can in the long run be a benefit. Right now, these funds are gonna run out in 2024. And so you may have a wonderful program that you're using ESSER funds for. And if you involve the community along the way in the decision of how those funds are being used, when the funds run out, you're able to go back to the community and say, this, this tutoring, this um, intensive intervention that we've been doing on the math side to bring our scores up, it's been very effective. We've been using ESSER funds to pay for that. We now don't have those funds anymore. Um, how could we gain community support or what resources do you as a community have to help support this program going forward if you in fact do want the program to move forward beyond 2024? That ask, if the community was part of the initial, we want this to happen discussion, um, is likely to bring about some pretty valuable resources, both from a staffing standpoint, but also from a funding standpoint. So I've been at, at several meetings where the community has advocated for a particular type of intervention or a particular item to be purchased by the school. And then later on th that funding disappears. And the community that initially rallied around the support for that activity comes together again to help continue the funding for it. So by engaging the community all along the way in this process of plans, and the plans are again, that safe return, how do I come back into the safe environment? But also how am I using these additional funds going forward? When you involve the community in that discussion, it really helps to build a partnership that can be very valuable. So I have on here a couple of samples that were used at the national level in discussing this topic. One of them is, why are all teachers not being paid more? 
So a new superintendent who comes on board, who may be looking at how the funds are being spent, may see that in the past, these funds were not spent to pay teachers more. Maybe there weren't stipends or bonuses allocated. And so one response could be, we use a salary scale based on, a, based on degree attained, degree attained, um, which does not take into account experience. That leaves fewer dollars for schools with junior teachers. We're eager to engage our teachers and community about options that might better serve our teachers and students. So you're saying you recognize that this pattern exists and saying that you wish to have the engaged community discuss how can you better serve your teachers with this salary um, discussion. Another one is uh, there's a lot of money being spent on something. And the question then is why? Why is it spent on this instead of something else? And again, particularly as a new superintendent coming in or any member of the school entity, looking at the district's expenses reveals some noteworthy patterns. We're eager to engage our community to explore best practices for these limited resources. It is important to understand that all of the expenditures and the allocations that are given to a school district are in fact public. They are posted on the OPI website as part of the compliance to the grant. So it's important to understand that those availability, that knowledge is available to the public and they may in fact come to a meeting and ask, why is the fund spent one way instead of another? Again, involving the discussion up front in that plan development in the how am I going to use these funds and embed it within that document uh, on the plan side, on the ARP ESSER plan side, can be an important uh, builder of bridges of sort of bringing those gaps or those differences together. Next slide, please. So going through grant the two plans together into one document, it won't be too large, but it will be larger than they are now, obviously, putting them in a PDF and uploading them into eGrants. There would then be a piece that you would have to indicate on the front page saying this is when I last updated them and so it would show that information. I gave sort of a, a sample on the right for Happy Smiles Elementary. Um, just kind of putting that out there as a way that it could be done. And of course it has to have the dates and that would be part of the compliance. This is a part of the committee, the review committee process that we're hoping to get feedback from uh, districts on. So as the districts are interested in improving the process, we really would like to have some of you participate in that discussion to tell us from your side what would work best. Um, it may in fact not be a better solution to have the two files combined and you may in fact want them to be separated out, but this is a, a possible um, solution to the confusion that seems to happen with these two uh, plans each year. I'm going to pause for a moment and just see if there are any questions. Um, we do have one question in the chat. Um, someone says, I can't locate an email from OPI regarding the ESSER ARP plan portal access, password, et cetera. Um, when was that email sent and what email address did it come from? So very good question. So um, it should have gone out the week of May 12th. They were generally sent May 12th, 13th, and 17th. Those are the three dates that most of them were sent out. There were a few outside of that. Um, if you send me your email, I mean, if you just send me an email and say, I can't find the access, I will send you those instructions again, as well as the portal access. If your school district has two different schools, you may in fact have to have two different plans. So there's some circumstances that, um, you may need two different portals instead of just one. One point to note in that is that many of the, uh, what is reported as the user access or the email access for the authorized representative actually is the authorized representative email followed by an underscore, followed by an LE four digit number. So that piece can kind of get a little confusing um, and so I can spell that out. It's partly in the instructions, but I can spell it out further. The other area that can sometimes be challenging and is in the email is what to do with cookies. So some districts could get in, but it wouldn't move forward. And you do need to have cookies removed in order to go back and forth between the screens. So um, those sort of tips and, and um, tricks in there are, are mentioned 
in the email. So very good question. I don't see any other questions right now. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat as we as we continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just in, in closing, want to again point to our OPI website. The ESSER tab has moved over to the right-hand side and we do have a lot of resources underneath that ESSER tab. You can um, find information with regards to your, your district's allocation of funds, but also what the current balance is. That balance is a review backwards from the previous month. So if you're looking on the 20th, it's not showing you the 20th, it's showing you last month. So that's just a little piece there to be aware of. Um, I know I have some districts sometimes that will ask, well, if I haven't really done anything new with regards to my art plan, my use of funds, it's still pretty much the same. Do I need to update it? And the answer to that is you definitely need to go in and review it. And if in fact you've done amendments, you do need to think about what are those amendments doing? So if in the amendment process, you changed from um, say purchasing a van for after school programming, uh, transportation or field trips, and you decided, no, we're not gonna do that. We're going to hire two additional paraprofessionals. That change, because it was an amendment change to the budget, would in fact reflect a change that could be reported in your plans. So. In a review backwards, can think about whether or not you have made amendments and what those amendments, were they to content or just uh, money in the sense that, you know, something didn't cost as much as you anticipated. Uh, but that would be something that you could put into your plans to do those updated, updated future view of how you're using the funds. Our contact information again is available here. You can reach us by email or by phone. Uh, we do encourage you to do either of those. It's always really nice to have an email that sort of gives us anchoring information so that then when you call, we can kind of review that at the same time or have done some research to be able to provide you with information. Uh, but you can e use either resource either way. And that, concludes our uh, presentation today. All of this information will be uploaded to our website and uh, next week. And so you'll be able to review not only today's sessions, but yesterday's and all the way from Monday, as well as tomorrow's sessions will be available for you to review. Thank you very much for attending today. And again, if any of you are interested in being part of the review committee, or you have any topics that you'd like us to cover, we are doing these trainings once a month for a whole week. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out and let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. Thank you so much today for attending.